Atlantis Rising Research Group, audiobooks. Egypt. Um, one thing that we're doing now, like I said, my mind is it's no longer a case, is the Sphinx older? It's how much older, so it's trying to accumulate data to pin that down. Pin down what I would say is constructional history of not just the Sphinx and the Sphinx and Valley Temple, but other structures on the Giza Plateau, um, which Wes will talk about more after dinner. Um, also, we went down to um, Abydos on this last trip and looked at this structure further. Uh, some of you are familiar with this. this can't say it now. Assyrian? Yeah, the tomb of Osiris traditionally. A um, very interesting structure because it's well, well below the um, ground level at New Kingdom times, maybe a good 50 feet or more below, um, behind the um, Temple of Seti. And architecturally seems to be a different style. Um, my inclination at this point, I think, Wes, you would agree too, is probably maybe transitional or not as old as the Sphinx, but older than dynastic. Would you agree with that? Yeah, he's sort of shaking his head. Yeah, um, but older than dynastic um, Egypt. And again, part of the point I want to make right now is I haven't, you know, one of the things that we were criticized for initially when we came out 10 years ago with the Sphinx being older, and really it's only a portion of the Sphinx because it's been recarved, it's mucked about, mucked about with the heads been recarved, etc. is, well, you. What, what's going on here? You just have the Sphinx and nothing else for thousands and thousands and thousands of years? Well, it seems not to be the case at all. It seems to be that when you start looking, you are finding other structures of intermediate age, um, other structures of uh, Sphinx age, if I could use that term, et cetera. So, you know, we're really piecing together, um, you know, a long history. Tie in with that, this is the so-called um, inventory of Stella, Stella of um, Cheops' daughter, or Khufu's daughter, that, um, uh, again, I say repeatedly because I don't read hieroglyphics, but, you know, it's, it's, it's late period. Um, I don't know, 26th dynasty or so. Um, but supposed to be a rendition, as I understand, of Old Kingdom text. <coughs> That's referring to the Sphinx as being around in Khufu's time and older than Khufu. Well, in fact, I think we have absolutely pinned down, and Colin Reed or even, um, and David Coxill independently have pinned this down, that yeah, of course the Sphinx was around in Khufu's time. Um, uh, at least that part of this inscription we now know is correct, despite what the Egyptologists have traditionally said. Um, I just point this out, these are tantalizing things, this is uh, um, uh, in the Cairo Museum. Uh, pre From Atlantis Rising Magazine number 111. Return to the Great Sphinx by Dr. Robert Schock. The geologist who startled the world by redating the Sphinx finds more evidence, it's even older than he once thought. Perhaps one of my distant ancestors or relatives preceded me here, among 19th and early 20th century graffiti inscribed on the entrance to Nefertari's Temple of Hathor at Abu Simbel can be found my name, Schock. I had noticed this on previous trips but this time it really impressed me. Perhaps I was feeling nostalgic, it was just short of a quarter century since I had first traveled to Egypt, in June 1990. As I have always found to be the case, my most recent trip, January 2015, yielded fresh revelations and new connections. My wife Katie, Catherine Ellisey, and I traveled with members and associates of the Commit School of Ancient Mysticism, including Yusuf and Patricia Oyen. Mohammed Ibrahim, and Gary Evans. One of the major points of discussion throughout the trip was that in many cases inscriptions, be they on temples, tombs, sculptures, or other objects, do not necessarily serve to date the origins of such objects. Certainly the shock inscription on the Abu Simbel temple does not mean that a shock had anything to do with the building of the structure. Yusuf and Muhammad pointed out case after case where an older statue or monument had been appropriated by a later pharaoh or notable and inscribed with his or her name. The concept of reappropriation is not a new idea. I came to this conclusion during my earliest studies, 1990, of the Great Sphinx of Giza and its associated temples. Egyptologist Salim Hassan, 1887-1961 who re-excavated the Great Sphinx in the 1930s, also noted many cases of reuse, 
including a classic example, which he discusses, in his 1949 book, The Sphinx, Its History in the Light of Recent Excavations, the Hyksos or Tanis Sphinxes. These are carved stone sphinxes, actually more accurately described as lions with human faces, they lack the full human head and headdress of more typical sphinxes, some of which are inscribed with the name of the 15th dynasty Hyksos pharaoh Apepi, Apepi, Apophis, IPP, who reigned in the 16th century BCE. Following the Hyksos period various Tanis sphinxes were reused over and over. An example, now housed in the Egyptian Museum, Cairo, includes cartouches of Apepi, Marinapta, 19th dynasty, reigned late 13th century BCE, and Pesib Kanu I, Sasen I, Pesib Sanu I, 21st dynasty, reigned late 11th century BCE. However, since at least the 19th century, it has been suspected that the statues are actually much older than Apepi and were reused during the Hyksos period. Some authors have even suggested that they date to pre-dynastic times, at least 1,500 years earlier. The consensus now appears to be that these sphinxes date to the Middle Kingdom, most likely to the reign of the 12th dynasty pharaoh Amenemhat III who ruled during the 19th century BC. Hassan concluded, the presence of the name of the Hyksos King Apopi, which occurs on some of these sphinxes, is only one of the many usurpations which they have undergone and recutting of the stone can be clearly seen, p. 99. Furthermore, these supposed Middle Kingdom sphinxes may, in fact, be reused older statues. It may be that some of the best specimens attributed to this period, Middle Kingdom, are in reality Old Kingdom, circa 27th to 22nd centuries BC, work, usurped and altered in detail to meet the prevailing fashion, Hassan writes, p. 96. It was not only these smaller sphinxes that were usurped but the Great Sphinx as well. Hassan describes how the Great Sphinx was venerated and reused during New Kingdom times, especially under the successive 18th dynasty pharaohs Amenhotep II and Thutmose, Thutmose IV, their reigns spanned the late 15th and early 14th centuries BC. The cult of the Great Sphinx persisted, being at times more or less popular, for nearly 2,000 years. What about the origins and earlier history of the Great Sphinx? Some early classical Egyptologists, 19th and early 20th centuries, thought the Great Sphinx might trace its origins to well before dynastic times. One such authority was Gaston Maspero, 1846-1916, who, among other positions, served for a number of years, 1881-1886, 1899-1914, as the Director General of Excavations and Antiquities in Egypt and co-founded the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, opened in 1902. Maspero suggested that the Great Sphinx is the most ancient monument in Egypt, older than the pyramids and other dynastic structures. Returning to Hassan, he ultimately attributed the Great Sphinx to the reign of the Old Kingdom 4th Dynasty Pharaoh Khafre, Khafre slash Hephren, circa 2500 BC reputed builder of the Second Pyramid on the Giza Plateau, an attribution not original to Hassan. Hassan did honestly note that, as to the exact age of the Sphinx, and to whom we should attribute its erection, no definite facts are known, and we have not one single contemporary inscription to enlighten us upon this point, p. 75. Many Egyptologists have contended that a granite stela, steely, erected between the paws of the Sphinx by Thutmose IV originally contained a portion of the name of Khafre, this part of the inscription has since flaked away, but the context in which Khafre was mentioned, if indeed this referred to the old kingdom pharaoh Khafre, has never been clear, was he a restorer rather than originator of the Sphinx, or perhaps simply a devotee? Concerning this stela, Hassan wrote in no uncertain terms, excepting for the mutilated line on the granite stella of Thothams IV, Thutmose IV, which proves nothing, there is not one single ancient inscription which connects the Sphinx with Khafre, p. 91. Since Hassan's time the situation regarding the attribution of the Great Sphinx has not changed. No new inscriptions or other definitive material have been uncovered, yet most conventional Egyptologists consider the Khafre slash Heferin attribution a fact. Christian Zivi Koche writes, Today, 
most Egyptologists agree that the Sphinx was an integral part of the funerary complex of Hephren, whom it depicts in the form of a lion with a human head, Sphinx, History of a Monument, 2002, p. 37. Regarding the notion that the face of the Great Sphinx is that of Khafre slash Hephren, this idea was falsified by the detailed analyses of facial expert Frank Domingo in the early 1990s, see the 1993 NBC documentary, The Mystery of the Sphinx. I have posited that the statue has its origins prior to dynastic times, which began approximately 5,000 years ago. The Proto-Sphinx, along with its associated temples, now commonly referred to as the Sphinx Temple, which sits immediately due east of the Sphinx, and the Valley Temple situated south of the Sphinx Temple, were reused and refurbished during the Old Kingdom. The head, whomever it may represent, is not the original head but a dynastic recarving, so even if it did represent the image of Khafre, all this would indicate is that Khafre appropriated and had reworked an older carving. My initial re-dating of the Sphinx was based in large part on the weathering and erosion patterns of the carved rock. These bear evidence of heavy precipitation and rain runoff, which is anomalous for the hyper-arid Sahara desert climatic regime that has persisted at Giza for the last 5,000 years, thus I suggested that the core body of the original statue must date back to an earlier and wetter climatic period, thousands of years prior to dynastic times. Seismic investigations around the Sphinx support this hypothesis. See my 2012 book, Forgotten Civilization. Important evidence for an earlier Sphinx, along with its associated temples, includes the repair campaigns carried out on the structures during the Old Kingdom, or possibly earlier. These temples consist of massive limestone walls faced with somewhat thinner but still massive blocks of granite. As early as my first trip to Giza in 1990, I concluded that the limestone cores of the temples represent very ancient structures which, subjected to the elements for thousands of years, became weathered and eroded, and were subsequently reworked and restored during the Old Kingdom, perhaps by Khafre circa 2500 BC, at which time the granite-facing stones were applied. See my 1999 book, Voices of the Rocks, on my most recent trip I had an opportunity to re-examine this key evidence and found it as compelling as I did 25 years ago. I also discovered that a native Egyptian Egyptologist, Basim El Shama, apparently independently, he does not cite or otherwise acknowledge my work, recognized the same evidence and came to the same conclusion. In a bookstall in the Aswan area, I found El Shama's 2003 book, Quest for the Truth, The Second Sphinx. Given the subject matter, I did not hesitate to purchase it. Later, when I had a chance to read through it, I was pleasantly surprised by the author's comments regarding the valley and Sphinx temples. The so-called Valley Temple is a mysterious building hewn, carved and built, I believe, before the pharaohs of the Old Kingdom came into power. It wouldn't surprise me if Egyptians built the Valley Temple together with the adjacent Sphinx Temple before the dynastic era, p. 100. Referring specifically to the Valley Temple, El Shama writes. The original stone, limestone core, is weathered and eroded to such an extent that anyone who looks at it believes that it was exposed for many years to wind, storms and other external natural factors. These factors participated in forming parallel concave erosions and weathering, similar to those, which are naturally formed on the body of our surviving Sphinx. By comparing these limestone layers of weathering to the very well-preserved pink granite outer casing, it definitely tells us that both were not exposed to the same natural factors for the same period of time. To prove this thought even further, you will find blocks of granite, carved in a certain shape to precisely fit inside an already weathered limestone wall. The difference between the limestone and the pink granite layers is the difference between both in time, p. 101. These are very much the same observations I first made in 1990. El Shama and most other Egyptologists agree, based in part on an inscription, now highly eroded, found on the granite of the Valley Temple that the granite outer casing dates to no later than the Old Kingdom. This means the limestone portions of the temples originated much earlier. Furthermore, based on geological analyses, 
I contend that the limestone blocks used to construct these temples were quarried from around the body of the Great Sphinx when it was carved, thus the temples and the core body of the Great Sphinx date back to the same early epoch. From El Shammah's book, it is apparent that he believes that the Great Sphinx, as well as a second Sphinx, since destroyed, associated with the Valley Temple, existed prior to the First Dynasty. How long before the First Dynasty, he does not state. Initially I estimated the original statue dates back to the period of circa 7000 to 5000 BC, or earlier. A quarter century later I now suggest that the Proto-Sphinx could well date back to the end of the last Ice Age, approximately 12,000 years ago. This is based on additional evidence that I lacked in the early 1990s, not only evidence pertaining directly to the Great Sphinx but also pertinent to the dating of other sites which I believe are contemporaneous with the origins of the statue, such as Gebekli Tepe in southeastern Turkey. See Discussion in Forgotten Civilization More support for this line of thinking, that the Great Sphinx and its associated temples were rebuilt and reused during the Old Kingdom, comes from a recent paper titled Surface Luminescence Dating of Some Egyptian Monuments, by Ioannis Liritsis and Asimina Vafiadu, 2014, Journal of Cultural Heritage. In this article the authors attempt to date various ancient Egyptian structures, including the valley and sphinx temples, using surface luminescence. To give a simplified view of this technique, luminescence, primarily trapped electrons, is built up in a rock due to exposure to ambient radioactivity, from radioactive elements such as uranium and thorium from cosmic rays, and from other sources. This stored geological luminescence is released, bleached, when a stone is cut and exposed to sunlight. If freshly cut surfaces of stone blocks are subsequently shielded from sunlight, for instance deep inside the interior of a wall, they will build up stored luminescence once again. If properly sampled, without exposing the rock to sunlight or other factors that will bleach out the stored luminescence, the stored luminescence can be released and measured in the laboratory and, with appropriate calibration, converted to a date. In their paper, Liritsis and Vafiadu present six dates taken on samples from the Sphinx and Valley Temples. All of their dates fall broadly within dynastic times, so a superficial reading of their paper might lead one to conclude that their work refutes the contention that these temples, and therefore the Great Sphinx as well, date back to a much earlier epoch. However, I suggest that a more considered review of their data leads to the opposite conclusion. Before examining the specifics of their six dates, it is important to first note that the authors state clearly that as little as a few minutes of exposure to sunlight can reset the surface luminescence of a rock to zero, so any reworking of a more ancient structure can reset the clock and the date obtained by surface luminescence dating will be the date of reworking and not the original date. This, I suspect, is the key to resolving discrepancies between their dates and my geological analyses of the structures. Now let us review their dates. On a sample of Valley Temple limestone they calculated a date of 1050 BC plus slash 540 years, and on a sample of Sphinx Temple granite they calculated a date of 1190 BC plus slash 340 years. These two dates are anomalously young, even by conventional Egyptological standards, but they are consistent unto themselves and may indicate reworking of the temples during the New Kingdom, a time when we know that a special interest was taken in the Great Sphinx. On a sample of Sphinx Temple limestone they calculated a date of 2220 BC plus slash 220 years. I suspect that this sample was exposed or reworked during repairs to the structure during the Old Kingdom. On a sample of the Valley Temple granite they calculated a date of 3060 BC plus slash 470 years. On two samples of the Sphinx Temple granite they calculated dates of 2740 BC plus slash 640 years and 3100 BC plus slash 540 years. These dates correspond to a period broadly compatible with the Old Kingdom. It has always been my contention that the granite was added during the Old Kingdom to repair and restore the earlier, much earlier, Sphinx Age, limestone temples. I believe the luminescence dates on the granite support this view. The Great Sphinx and its associated temples have a long history, 
and that history begins thousands of years prior to the rise of dynastic Egypt.